So uh, we've come a long way from that invisibility, and one of the purposes I wanted, wanted to write the book was to talk about GLS and what it did. I also wanted to take a look, the surprising turn for me was taking a look at the terms I had taken in my political career or my political activism, how it changed over the years. Um, and talking about process, so my process was to put up a chart of every year from 1969 to present and then try to figure out what I did each year. Uh, and then you know, decide which items each year I should cover or not cover and which ones might be interesting to the reader or to members of our community um, and stringing that all together. And I think I got a 400 page manuscript which my publisher is here today, John, John Templeton, my publisher everybody. Cut down to 320 pages, <laughs> uh, uh, and, I'm, and they did a great job doing so. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that about the, the role of the, the gay liberation movement. You, mainly, you know, we use a few things in parts, gay liberation, not the gay activist alliance. There's two primary exemplars of that movement, and you're in both those organizations at different times, because I, I get tired of saying to people, they say, you know, why was, you know, Stonewall, 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 and I say, well, Stonewall is only important because what came out of Stonewall, the gay liberation movement, that's, you know, put Stonewall would be at best a footnote in history if it had not created the gay liberation movement. And the only reason it, that's important is that it was the creation of the gay liberation movement that made it absolutely possible. Thus, our success is today. And I can say, you know, learning about Stonewall without learning about the gay liberation movement is kind of learning about the fall of Bastille and knowing nothing about the French Revolution. And the French Revolution is much more important than the fall of Bastille. That just says it all. That's one of the reasons I titled my book, Stonewall, The Rights to Spark the Gay Revolution. It wasn't a revolution, it was the event that set it off. But it, I find it very hard to get people to actually read books, you know, like Don's book or uh, other books that were really Great. good. And now I have another book I can refer to too. Okay, um, what was the most difficult part of writing the book, Mark? Oh, that's easy. Um, so when I did the uh, outline, I noticed all of a sudden that for some odd reason, from years 1982, through 1990, I didn't have anything listed. <laughs> and I started thinking, what did I do during that period of time? I had nothing listed. And I literally had to research myself. And I realized we were in the battle for AIDS. It was a war. And so then I started, I had to read my own newspaper, just look through it week by week to see what I was doing. And I started filling it up. And it surprised me and amazed me what we were doing as a community and how we were surviving and the war we were waging. Um, and so that became that part of it. That was really hard. And if you read the book, I, I think it's the most challenging chapter to read. It's the only one where I think some of my anger comes out. Um, I really get angry and I think it helped me find myself and give myself some peace about AIDS. Okay, and we both uh, were fortunate to have the same great editor, Michael Denny. So I'm wondering what was your experience like working with Michael? Oh, well, so uh, this is a great story to tell now. So for those, when you write a book, or in my case anyway, you once you finish the first chapter, you don't read it. You keep chapter two, chapter three, all the way through. You don't read back, at least I do. So I wrote the whole thing. Uh, my now husband, Jason, took a look at it, uh, did a little editing. Then I sent it off to John. Uh, and then they did a, sh a small edit and sent it back to me. And my initial reaction was, we're not gonna publish this. Uh, and luckily, uh, he said, well, let us send it to this guy, see if he'll take it on as a project and let him be uh, the deciding factor. And they sent it to Michael Dennehy, who I had heard of. If those of you who don't know Michael Dennehy is, uh, Michael used to be the head of St. Martin's Press, and he also happens to be a, a great book editor, uh, one of the books he did is The Life of Times of Harvey Milk. Um, and so I didn't know that at the time. And so, uh, of course, they sent it off to Michael Dennehy. I, of course, Google Michael uh, and see all his credits. Think, oh, this is great. Now, if you've read the book, there's a real slap at Harvey Milk in the book. Um, I, for those of you who haven't read it yet, you might want to read that. It's kind of interesting. So I figured, oh, he's going to really hate this because there's a slap at Harvey in this. Uh, and uh, about six weeks later, he called me up and uh, went up to his apartment, and he said, it's a damn good book, it's a great read. On top of that, it's historically something that needs to get out there. 
that really is probably, and, and he said, of course, I'll take it on. Um, and I, I expected an enormous amount of edits. And when I got it back, his primary edit was, it's in great condition. The only thing you have to get rid of is all the flashbacks. Well, the problem with that was that every single chapter started with a flashback. Because <laughs> um, my assumption was that none of the young kids today would be at all interested in what happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. So I started each chapter with something current and then, you know, flash back to the past. Well, he told me to do, the book had to be in chronological order. So um, never having written a book before, uh, newspaper business is totally different. Uh, than the book business, and knowing nothing, I took the advice of an expert, and uh, he showed me how to put it in chronological order, which is what he primarily did. Um, and it didn't lose its voice anywhere along the way. Um, and most people say to me, well, my favorite compliment is, uh, I feel like I'm talking to you. Yeah, your voice has come through very clearly, and uh, Michael is a fan of the book, and I'm a fan of his. <laughs> we well, should all be a fan of Michael then. Yeah. He also did the Stonewall series of books that St. Martin's did, which is the whole collection of gay books. He also did Christopher Street. Uh, Man has an incredible career. Yeah. Okay, well, moving on from the process of writing the book to actually what's in the book, um, you came to a very difficult path. I mean, you came from a very difficult background where there are a lot of financial difficulties. But the story of your origins as an activist, I was very interested to find, stretched back to your being Jewish and refusing to sing all more Christian soldiers in school, but your mother attacked you on that. Can you tell us that story? Uh, one, one of the things, one of the stereotypes you get by being Jewish is that everybody thinks you are middle class or above. And uh, where I come from in Philadelphia, which is where I spent the last 40 years of my activism, uh, I become somewhat of a known personality. And when you become a known personality, people project certain things on you. And it gets to a point where you can't keep correcting people. So you just shake your head, yes. So in my city, Philadelphia, everyone thinks I was brought up in a middle-class Jewish neighborhood called the Northeast. And everybody in Philadelphia thinks I graduated Temple University, um, it, which I didn't do. Uh, it, it got to the point where the president of the Temple University who had a party actually came up to me and started screaming at me for not belonging to the alumni association. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I said at the end, yes, I'll join. Um, you because you point. just can't fight that anymore. I mean, I've had teachers coming up to me and saying they taught me at Temple, um, which they did not. But long story short, uh, when I was born, my parents had been uh, by eminent domain taken away from the store they had owned and put in a housing project in South Philadelphia by the name of Wilson Park. So I, we grew up as the only Jewish family in a Christian South Philadelphia uh, housing, public housing project. And so therefore, as I was growing up in the 1950s, you get the usual, um, you're the devil, uh, you killed our Christ. By the time I was eight years old, I was wondering, you know, when those horns came in on top of my head, how did you comb, how was I going to comb my hair? I had no idea. Um, and when we got to school, in those days, it was still school prayer. And they did some singing. And one of the songs was all about Christian soldiers. And I didn't know why, but for some odd reason, I didn't want to sing that song. Uh, and the teachers screamed and yelled at me, and I got punished. And I went home and told my mother, and my mother came into the school and said, look, we're Jews. We're not Christian. We're not going on any crusade. Uh, and um, the agreement was that I would, when the song was being sung, I would stand up and just be silent. And that was the sort of compromise. Of course, everybody in school didn't like me very much. Uh, but I got, sort of got used to that. Uh, at 13, my grandmother, who uh, was very influential in my upbringing, uh, Fanny Weinstein was her name. Fanny Weinstein came from the old country, in this case being Russia, uh, where her family had to leave because of the pogroms. She came to the United States, and as a teenage girl, she joined the suffragette movement. And when I was 13, uh, she came and got me, swooped me out of the house one day, and I found myself marching around City Hall with Cecil B. Moore and Robert N. C. Nitz for my first civil rights demonstration, which was very important because um, in 1974, when I was back in Philadelphia, the first gay rights bill got introduced in Congress, uh, and 
uh, I get a call on the phone from Bella Abzug while I'm in Philadelphia. And the phone call goes like this, Mark! <laughs> yes, Bella? I introduced this gay rights bill! What can I do to help you? It's not going nowhere! <laughs> well, I'm not in Congress, what can I do? Take a look at it! So she sent it, sent it down to me, I looked at it, and I said, well, Bella, the first problem is there are only four sponsors. She says, hey, I went to a sign! What do I do? I said, you should get some of, uh, from the African American Caucus. She says, okay, get me one! <laughs> So I went to my local congressman, and I said, Congressman, uh, I marched with you when I was 13 years old. Um, I think it's time for you to help my community. It was Robert N.C. Nix who then become Congressman Robert N.C. Nix. And Robert N.C. Nix, one of the founders of the Black Caucus, became the first black co-signer of, of what we now call NCAA.